கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதகதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் நமஸ்தே <laughs> Because there, that buzz in the background really it makes it hard to understand what you say. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, I was saying I was been, uh, have been following you since 2019. Uh-huh. Yeah, since then I've been uh, very much devoted to Shakti. To what? Amba. So I've been devoted to Shakti. Ambal. Ambal. Now you're talking. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in southern India, we call Ambal more, as you know, since you've lived there. Yeah. Yeah. And I never knew about Chatur Darshanam. And before even, I was like so much uh, in between, uh, stuck in duality. and more of uh, karma yoga and um, ritualistic practices well that's all it's all good yeah so it i was really really um, after getting to know that how the chatur darshanam works and uh, how it is like much more practical and uh, everything fits it's within the chatur darshanam it's like something really beautiful yes shankaracharya yeah. huh Shankaracharya. Yeah, you know how I found out about it? It was through Ramana Maharshi. He has a book called Guru Vachana Kovai. Guru Vachana Kovai is a collection of verses written by Muruganar. Mm. And uh, of uh, like versifying Ramana's teachings. And yeah. he would show them to Ramana and Ramana would approve them or correct them or whatever. So anyway, there's over a thousand verses. Yes, uh, I've heard Guru Vachakupo. It's, it's really, really beautiful. It's and amazing. I feel a sky ball in many of them. But anyway, in verse 83, Ramana reveals that he is teaching on the uh, platform of meditation. Uh, he, he is not teaching on karma yoga or bhakti yoga. He's teaching on dhyan, raja yoga. Raja yoga. Yeah. yeah. And that he himself, of course, is in jnana, jnana yoga, uh, the highest right. platform. But he descends, he comes down a step to talk to his disciples. Yes. That is I, the beauty of a yogi, a true yogi is he never, he looks at everyone with an equal eye. He never looks upon someone or he never converts them into his view or, you know. Right. That's something really beautiful about a real, actual realized sage is that he uh, descends from his view, consciousness to the duality and has to teach him or her the Yeah, uh, that's, that's why I about. that's why I got into Sri Vidya because um, I realized about three years ago that my audience was not getting the non-dual teachings. I was doing a series on Uladu Narpadu and you know, but um, a little bit of Guru Vachika Kovai and like that. So I realized I have to give a, a duality-based teaching so that those people can also have some platform, you know, uh, and they don't, they're not tempted to, to try to jump up prematurely. I think that's the problem is that everyone wants to jump up very soon. I think it's 
uh, this is because of the age, I believe, Kali age or Kali Yuga or some it has some effect is that no one wants to do the hard work and no one wants to go through this, you know, layer step by step process. And it's just that the top view is so attractive and so fascinating that everyone is drawn into it. Like, so I think it will be a good idea that before any video, I was always thought in my mind, you really put your heart and soul into every video. I felt that you should put this video is on the platform of this WADA or this duality would be much more easy for you. Well, you know how I got into this was through being a musician. Temple musician, yes. When, you know. Yeah, when you're a musician, you learn how to practice. And you learn that the fundamentals are the most important thing to practice, even if you're expert. You still have to practice the fundamentals. I remember there's a story about Andre Segovia, the great guitarist, classical mm. guitarist. Mm. And uh, even at age 80, 83, something like this, he was still practicing fundamentals, scales and stuff like that. And someone asked him, you're such a great master. Why do you have to practice that stuff? And he said, if I don't practice for one day, I can hear the difference. If I don't practice for two days, my wife can hear the difference. And if I don't practice for three days, my friends can hear the difference. And that's, you know, unacceptable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I've always laid a lot of stress on the fundamentals. If you go back to the beginning of our series with matrix learning, or what is it called now? Foundation. Becoming genius and yeah, the foundation. Being, yeah. Talk yeah. about being and becoming. And yeah, these are fundamental. How we get conditioned. Yeah, this is the fundamental. Yeah. Yes. And the thing is that very thing which Buddha described was he observed how things as it is, um, the Nama Rupa follows consciousness and how things, how we get uh, the human mind gets conditioned. You know, that's something, uh, something really beautiful. I mean, dependent origination. Yeah, dependent origination, Paticca Samupada. Yeah, it's the most amazing thing. That's what drew me into the Buddhist teaching. Until then, I really wasn't interested in it. Um, I was a devotee, a Krishna devotee, for many years. And even after I got first path, because I didn't have the background. I didn't know what it was. Uh, even it, it happened to me, but I didn't understand it. <laughs> so, so, yes, I believe this is where um, uh, the hunger for the truth or draws you. It, it teaches you things even without you knowing. Uh, that's happened with me. That's happened with you. And it's just that you should be... Uh, you should be, have a good intention. You should have, as you say, uh, if you want a true guru, you should be the, the, the good disciple gets the true guru. Yeah, the appetite for truth is the basis of everything. So if you have that, somehow or other, <laughs> you will come to the truth. You know, because God is, is watching. Devi From is... Yeah, Ambal is watching everything as yes. Kundalini. Yes. So she is without and within. Uh, so she knows everything. And her laws are the laws of the universe. And that includes the spiritual progress, karma, everything. Everything. So, you know, the saying, when the disciple is qualified, the guru shows up. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's like that. When she sees we're ready, we get the next step. You know, even if we don't understand it, she'll just bless us. <laughs> yes, I think this is, uh, should be an eye-opening fact for everyone. It also gives us a hope for everyone watching too. I mean, do not lose hope that I think that enlightenment is very far away or it's like, of course, it is not something. It takes a lifetime. It is just, doesn't come just like that, but it's just that um, 
I don't know. It, it is as it is, just be yourself, like it is a self. The self, yeah. The one self without a second. And that is everyone. So this is why yeah. we respect everyone, you know, we, we honor everyone because everyone is the self. Yes. Ultimately. That's why we call namaste to everyone. We, I, I, I honor the divine in you. Yes. So I was even, actually enjoying your conversation with uh, Richard Clark about Rebu Gita. Oh, really Richard! Nice. Richard's one of my favorite people. <laughs> and the funny thing is, we've never met in person. It's all been online. Oh. He left Tira Vanamalai uh, just before I came there five years ago. Mm. So Vanamalai, okay. Yeah. Yeah, he likes Ramana Ashramam, especially he likes to uh, sit down there and meditate. He really likes the uh, the divine vibration in Ramana Ashram, which is definitely oh, yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, you can't deny it. You can't. <laughs> Anyone who stays there, you know, even the local people who don't really appreciate Ramana, um, they get the benefit also. Even the Muslims and Christians there. They're also yeah. getting the benefit, but they don't know. <laughs> it, yeah, <laughs> you're right. It's just out of ignorance that mistakes happen or they just, you know, a person gets deviated from the path of self-realization. Then no one does things. It's all out of, I believe, ignorance. All bad karmas or anything is done out of, just out of ignorance. That's the thing. Everyone is potentially enlightened. Uh, or Ramana would say everyone is actually enlightened. They just don't know it, that's all. They don't recognize it. Yeah, as my father would say about Kanji Mahaprabhu, which you're, whom you're very familiar about, I believe. Uh, yeah. Paramacharya, Kanji Mahaprabhu. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he used to say out of a mango tree, not everyone like not every fruit, uh, thing becomes a ripe mango. He used to quote that for a person, for a self-realized person. Yeah. They, one has to be destined and one for self-realization. That's true. Uh, when I look back at my life, it's clear that I was set up to be a sadhu. My family situation and, you know, my inner makeup and nature and all is directed me to be a sadhu. I had really no choice about it. As soon as I found books about yoga, when I was like 12, 13 years old, that was it. I was hooked. By 16 You were drawn was, into it. Huh? You were drawn into it. Yes. Just like a, and by jump 16, like, like a lion. I was already a, a vegetarian, you know, probably the only one in my town. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, so it is destiny that when we are ready, when we're qualified, then Ambal draws us in. She, she takes us in to her world, which runs by very different rules. It does. And um, I wanted to ask you about Yoga Maya and Mahamaya, which I believe have the Hare Krishna people have got it like their own views about it, and the Advaitans have got a different view about it, I believe. So, so what do you think about that? Well, you know, I was in that group for over 20 years. Uh, I was a close disciple of Prabhupada, I edited his books and everything. And uh, because he was pushing the dualistic philosophy, um, you know, he makes a lot of distinctions. Like, the, what's the difference between Mahamaya and Yoga Maya? Really, there's nothing. They're the same. It's the Maya. There's one yeah. Maya. Yeah, it just depends on how you look at it. She can appear as an enemy to some people um, because she sets up all kinds of tests 
You know, we, she makes us prove our self-realization at every step. And if there's yeah. any defect, you know, it immediately becomes obvious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yoga maya is a very interesting concept because it's the same maya, right? But with consciousness of relationship with God. That's the only difference. Personal relationship. Yes, right. Devotional relationship. Rasa tattva. Okay. Bhava. Yoga. Uh, Bhakti bhava. Bhakti bhava. Okay. Yeah. So when that relationship is there and that, that taste, you know, that emotional taste of rasa, um, whether it's in uh, satya rasa, dasya rasa, or whatever, whatever taste it is, madhurya rasa is the best. Um, I somehow find the um, bhakti rasa is so beautiful. It's just that it's really, really hard to come out of it. And that's when I really I approached you. I understood what was Raja Yoga. And then I could really feel that there are levels about that. So bhakti is not everything. Yeah. Yeah. Everything so. it goes step by step. You know, so when you're karma yoga, when you have sufficient punya, then you automatically develop bhakti. And when bhakti matures into frame, you automatically develop meditation, concentration, you know, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, all the higher stages of yoga develop automatically from that taste. So that's so why the, you, you can't omit any of the stages. Every stage is equally important. Yes, in its time. Do not force anything. Just, just let it go naturally. It is. Yeah, it, it's not that one is better than the other. Mm -hmm. It's just like if you're growing a tree, you plant a tree, you can't say that the stage when it gives the fruits is better than the stage when it's a sapling. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, the tree is the same. Each stage is important for the other to grow. Yes, and with if you try to omit one stage, the, the tree is finished. <laughs> yes. You can't right. make it give fruits. Yes. The perfect example for um, a neo Advaita would be the rice and pot example, rice, pot, and the fire example. Like you need all of them to, for the, you know, the rice to... You tell it, tell the whole story. Yeah, it's just that um, Niyadvaita is much more common these days on the rise, especially it's because I just, as I told in the beginning that people are just drawn into meditation. Meditation has become like pretty much a business these days. Yeah. So everyone wants to sit down, close their eyes. They think it's an experience. They think it's an adi uh, something, uh, they're adding something. So that's very, I think it's the mindset which you sit down to meditate. That's the most important thing. It's not something you want to add anything. You want to, the meditation is a subtractive process, not a process That's to add anything. A very important point. Yeah, we're not so, adding something to the being. The being is already perfect. We're taking away the false things. Neti neti. Neti neti. It's, it is the subtract. Neti neti is subtraction. So, bhava again. So, bhava is the mindset. You sit down to meditate. So if you sit down to the meditate that I want to get, I want to get enlightened, when that's a wrong mindset. Because at, enlightenment, as Swami says, it's already present. It's already a natural state. At that stage, you don't even have to sit down and formally meditate, you know. It just happens spontaneously while walking, while working, while doing this and that, going here and there. You cannot stop thinking of your Ishta Devata. Absolutely. And I, I have felt this within myself. My devata is the Shakti, right? For example, it, it is Shakti. So I always, I'm drawn to the goddess. I don't know, naturally. Uh -huh. And yeah, I just, it didn't come but all of a sudden because I was looking for my devata all of a sudden, but I was always regularly chanting mantras, mantras. But every time I chant uh, 
Lalita Devi uh, Sotram or Sahasranama, I feel really, really drawn to Lalita Devi. Oh, Lalita Sahasranama is the most powerful prayer I know. Yeah, it is. And it has everything in it. The whole philosophy is in it. Kundalini Yoga is in it. Bhakti, Gyan, everything. <laughs> it, it encompasses every single thing you can, uh, yeah, you can say, you can talk about. It has all the words. You, um, I, I still have your uh, the confidential meaning of Laita Sasama. I've downloaded every single thing. I read that every time. And yeah, every single word, the meaning, it has all the secrets you want to know. It's all there in that. That's right. I wish so more people of you would download out. it. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, they just want to watch the videos and have me tell it. <laughs> <laughs> But really, you have to do the work yourself. No, no substitute. We can help yeah. get people interested in it. And that's the value of the videos. But uh, until you actually sit down and go through it yourself and contemplate those meanings, then you start to get the real benefits. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you. Now, how would we, in the living in this society, which is like literally totally conditioned or designed in a way to take us away from this path of self-realization or knowing the actual Vedic truths, how does one um, channelize his or her efforts and try to do their best in order to minimize such distractions? You know, what would you give the tips to the general people? The society. Well, I can only uh, give advice from my own experience. I also felt this conflict and I resisted for a long time, uh, you know, going into the business world and everything like that. Uh, I was very fortunate to have talent in music and I was able to make uh, a good living as an independent composer during my twenties. But then the corruption of the music business started to weigh on me really heavily. In good conscience, I couldn't continue with it. Um, so I joined my guru's ashram when I was 27. And one thing led to another. And I wound up being an editor on his books, the Sanskrit and English editor. So, he trained me up and uh, when I left the temple, when I became a householder, uh, I got married and even had a couple of kids. I worked as an independent writer, technical writer for over 25 years. I had my own business. I worked at home. Uh, I, I used to joke that my whole business fit in my back pocket because uh, that's where I kept my checkbook. <laughs> so a very simple solution to the economic problem uh, with the minimum amount of association with the, the you know, business world, cutthroat competition and politics and all this nonsense that goes on in these corporations. I tried to separate myself as much as possible from that. And it meant that I earned less money, but I didn't care as long as I had adequate funds. And I worked in- Do your sadhana. Yes. As long and, as you had to get funds to do your sadhana, nothing else matter. Right. I would save up money and then I would go to India for a year or two and then come back and make some more money. And that was my lifestyle. And at the end, I had worked enough and my accountant was a good guy, so he paid all my taxes and everything on time. And I got social security benefits. So from that point, I was completely independent of any business or you know organizations or anything like that. And uh, that's been the, one of the greatest blessings. So I always advise people during the karma yoga phase, to take care of your finances so that you can literally drop out 
of the workforce and business and all that stuff and just devote yourself to stuff. So really it was uh, my guru's blessing. He trained me up as an editor and I became a writer. Oh. Yeah, I mean, uh, I brought up this question because I believe I saw a comment on one of your videos. Someone really had uh, written, written this and I really wanted also the audience to also know because um, and all of us are just uh, trying, trying to, you know, really um, grow up spiritually and uh, devote, uh, devote more, most of the time to uh, self-realization. So I really wanted to bring up this particular thing. Yeah, it's a struggle. You know, there's no accident that Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita on a battlefield. And he was urging Arjuna to, you know, plunge in and fight. Don't hold back. You have to fight to get what is rightfully yours. That's just the way the world is. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. nobody can do anything about it. It's the way it's set up by Maya. Uh, yeah. Maha Maya. <laughs> Maha Maya. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, talking about Mahabharata, you were saying that how Krishna shed the, like, um, he spoke out the divine truth as well as it was designed in a way it was very hard to interpret Mahabharata. I really like what you said because I, because I find it was so true. It's um, bewildering. It, yeah. It, yeah. Because it's, it's, first of all, it's written from a very high knowledge of human nature and spirituality. You know, if Vyasa or whoever wrote it had to have deep, deep knowledge of how people think and how they act and react and so on. And I find it very interesting that the story is so compelling. You know, the story of the Pandavas and Kurus and the conflict and everything, it's, it's high drama. It's, it's better than Shakespeare, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the, uh, the spiritual truths are so cleverly woven into the story, you don't really feel like you're being lectured. You feel like it's an integral part of, of the story. And that gives it a lot of heart you know, a lot of character. So it's a really well put together piece of literature. But ultimately, it seems the purpose of Mahabharata was to introduce Krishna. Because previous to Mahabharata, there had been very little or no mention of Krishna in any of the Puranas. Nor, nor as well as the Vedic texts. Not as, no, Vedic texts don't mention Krishna at all. At all. So, what to make of that? You know, ultimately, it doesn't matter whether it's history or fiction, because the real uh, payload, you know, the real meaning of it is the spiritual truths that are inculcated in the story. So, um, those are good. Bhagavad Gita explanation of everything is very good. It's just kind of out of order. And yeah, he begins yeah. with karma yoga, but then he goes into all these other topics, and even Arjuna gets confused. <laughs> He's like, you're saying all these different things, but I still don't understand what I should do. Yeah. Huh? Arjuna <laughs> so, always has questions. Yes, he asks questions. Yeah, he has the best questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Even for the Arjuna, who was like extremely has a lot of punya to be in that place to even ask those questions, really, you know, it shows that how uh, the whole process of self regulation is step by step. All the subtle darshana is really coming here into play. Yeah, and at the end, Krishna again has to summarize the whole thing. Mm. Right. And then finally yeah. Arjuna gets it. <laughs> He's like, okay, yeah. And this is a big issue because you have to balance 
duality and non-duality. They're both important. And you, you can't just neglect the duality because you think it's Maya or whatever. You cannot just neglect it, absolutely. No, it's just like you have to take care of your body so that you have a platform for self-realization. If you're sick or poor, poverty stricken, or in some other difficulty, then you know you, you have to take some remedy for it. And uh, that's very interesting that Vishnu Sahasranam says in the um, at the end, what is that called? The um, it's giving the results. Like if you chant this Vishnu Sahasranam, you get so many things. What is that called? Sri Rama Rama Rameti. Yeah, that famous sloka. I remember. Yeah. Ah, uh, Sri Rama Rama I believe Rama, Rame, you. Me, I saw one of your Rame, videos. Rame, Mano, Rame. Sahasranama Satpunyam. Huh? Sri Rama Nama Varanane. Yes. Yes. Ah, what a beautiful sloka. Wow. Absolutely. So he's saying that by hearing and chanting these thousand names, you get released from all kinds of problems. And this is also my experience. I chanted that Vishnu Sahasranam like multiple times a day for many years. And I think it's a big reason why today I have such good facility for spiritual life and for helping others. You took the efforts to learn Sanskrit and yeah. took the efforts to, yeah, it's, it's something out of, I don't know, I have no words to say. Well, it, really was, beautiful. it was by Guru's grace. Yeah, my Adi Guru, he needed as an editor, a Sanskrit editor. And I was the type of person, I'm not afraid to look things up. So if you're going to work with Sanskrit, you got to have that big, thick Sanskrit dictionary right by yourself. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so to all the viewers watching who are trying to learn Sanskrit, uh, Swami is an example where he just tried and uh, God is within helps you. If you try to even make an effort, so somehow she helps you succeed in it. If yeah. your intent is pure, if you really want to do it, you will get it. You know, it's very interesting that she, like any mother, loves to satisfy her children's desires. So uh, when she sees that we desire something, even if it's bad for us, she'll actually, she'll give that to you. Now, see, see what happens. Now learn the lesson from this. You know, she can be... Yeah. She can be very uh, strict disciplinarian sometimes, like any mother. Yeah. Any good mother will punish the child if he if the child is doing something that that's bad, you know, that will hurt the child. So you know, this hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> kind of. Thing. And um, so I mean, so is it important just to be patient? Having patience is the key. Yeah, I, again, I go back to learning a musical instrument. You can't be in a rush. If you do, you'll pick up too many bad habits. And then you have to spend twice the time to unlearn them and learn again the right way. So the, the, the lesson is do the fundamentals, look up the words, Learn the meanings of the shlokas. Go deep into it. Don't be satisfied with anybody else's interpretation. Look into it for yourself. Yeah, that's why I always, uh, like when you always used to say something, go to the source. Uh -huh. I, I remember that you always say, which is really good. Always go to the source and inter uh, find out the meaning. The yeah, don't take anything just literally on faith. Even my explanation, huh? it might not be the one you need to hear. Absolutely. But if you go to the source and work it out for yourself, then according to your intelligence, you'll see the meaning that's right for you.
That's the way this thing works. <laughs> Which means experience, experience is learning. Yes. And doing. Uh, not only learning, but practice. Doing the sadhana. Oh, the, you do. The, the benefits I've gotten from uh, sadhana are just, I mean, they can't be described. There's so much. Uh, and a lot of it is uh, preemptive protection. A lot of bad things don't happen because of your sadhana. It's hard to see that. But, you know, I'll give you an example, again, from my own experience. I've traveled all over the world since I was actually uh, like 19 or 20 because of being a musician and then later being a sadhu. And then later on, you know, being a teacher. I had ashrams in Mexico, in uh, Peru, Chile, and then in India, three or four different ashrams and traveled you know to many many different countries and i've been in places where there's no foreigners for a hundred kilometers in every direction and i was never afraid i was never in a bad situation i never got robbed or mugged or you know even uh, bitten by a snake or any of the terrible stuff that people say will happen to you it never happened and I think one reason is that I respect people and I respect their cultures. You know, and I don't try to impose my views, but this rather- called acceptance. Sorry? This is called acceptance, accepting other people as they are. And respect. Yes. This is yeah. also a form of bhakti. I think so, yes. Yes. And ananya bhakti. Ananya bhakti. Yeah, that, that that means, yeah. We uh, are we are not different. We're all trying to solve this problem of human existence. The only difference is where we are on the path and the particular methods that we're using. But everybody's yeah. in the same situation. Yeah, we're in this together. So everybody is trying their best. Even if <laughs> Even they're, they're maybe doing something or believing something that we don't accept, but that's our problem. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine. I always think when someone, yeah, it's like eventually they'll get it someday or some lifetime, they'll eventually come up. Because once you know this, is, you'll like reach the top, then of course, I believe it's uh, subjective or it's individual perceptions vary. I totally respect other people, the other person's religion or whatever faith other one follows, it's all going to the same path. It's all Nirguna Brahman at the end of the day. Well, you know, in a sense, it's none of our business what other people think. You know, uh, I love this saying that uh, what you think of me is none of my business. Yeah. You know, and also what other people think about whatever they're thinking about is, is really none of our business unless they choose to share it. Yeah. Then we can receive it with respect, you know, and, and that's fine. We may not agree, but, you know, we don't have to fight with them. Let them be. And they let us be. That's really the way human society should be. Not all these constant fighting about vaccines and <laughs> economics and politics and all this stuff that occupies so much of people's time and energy. If they put that energy yeah. into searching for God, oh, they would make so much advancement. Oh, yeah. Oh, that world would be a beautiful place. Yeah. But see, Maya makes it like that so we have incentive to get out otherwise if everything was beautiful where's the incentive to do sadhana like the devas the demigods everything is so nice huh? 
they have enjoyment 24 hours a day. There's no time for sadhana. And the same thing in, in the, the, the Naraka, the, he, the hellish planets. The suffering yeah, that's is, the yeah, it's so intense. There's no time or, or ability to do anything sadhana. But an earth planet, it's more or less balanced. There's some enjoyment, yeah, but there's some suffering too. Uh, so we have the means to do sadhana, but we also have the incentive. So this is why even the demigods want to take birth on the earth planet, so they can finish their sadhana. Yeah. So how are we doing on time? Just a few minutes left. Okay. So what do you want to yeah. talk about? <laughs> I want to talk about the so, uh, one main thing I want to talk about is uh, how whenever yeah I really want to share um, I want to share like all these to the general audience I'm like how do I share it I'm like how do I get people it's not that I want to convert them out of course that I'm not that kind of person which is why I'm really uh, I really like the way because. You really you have always said that you never wanted to be a guru in the first place. And you never wanted to start an organization. I was really, really inspired by that. But also at the same time, I thought, thought I should uh, share uh, such beautiful, beautiful teachings with everyone also, because the world needs it. And yeah, so I really wanted to use a um, suitable platform for that. You can make videos too, or you can share our videos on social media. Yeah, I was, uh, I was thinking of uh, sharing it on Facebook, but Facebook these days is, I don't know, I shall I'll probably try it out. Well, you know, it's always going to be, as the Bible describes it, pearls before swine. Oh. <laughs> the world is a nasty, degraded, you know, noisy place. Everyone is constantly disturbed and always thinking of different mundane things. So the most you can do is just, you know, put it out there and those who are ready to hear it will hear it. Yeah. You have to trust in that. Yeah and not hold back uh, because you're afraid of what people will think or you know any of that. Uh, you can always use a pseudonym. I do. Yeah, that'll be really good. Yeah, I do. I, you know, when I'm in Sri Lanka, I'm known as Dhamasara Upasaka. When I'm in India, I'm known as Adya Shakti Swami. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? When I'm in New York, I'm known as, hey, you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I believe uh, I saw your English name in the email address. Yeah. David, something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's funny, my mother named me, named me Dave. Oh. It came out David, you know, on the official documents but uh, she she always called me Dave and then later on uh, Osho Rajneesh also named me Dave oh also Dave okay uh, Dave that's good <laughs> well the people next door are doing the starting their tuk-tuks <laughs> okay but um, so, um, one more know, thing is about your Alicante your Alicante uh, spring retreat. That's kind of on the shelf. Mm. Um, it's not working out um, because the, the fellow who would host me uh, turns out that he's a, how can I say, a wild speculator. And even though mm -hmm. he claims to be my disciple, uh, mm -hmm. It's not exactly following our thinking. Oh, okay. I see. So, yeah, I, 
I, I don't want to get involved with all the, you know, vaccine politics and stuff like that. Oh, no, not at all. Yeah. Um, like I was explaining uh, the other day, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but I'm not a vaccine fascist either. Mm. I don't think, you know, that people should be locked up or prevented from traveling or any of that stuff. People should be free. Um, anyway, that's not my area. I don't have any authority, you know. I, I'm not a none, none of my business. It's none of, none my, of business. my business. <laughs> it's written there, right there. <laughs> <laughs> it saves so much time and energy, right? Yes. None of my so, the, in a nutshell, anything which deviates you from your sadhana leading to self realization, any kind of sadhana is none of your business. Really? Because that is the prime business in human life to get free, to attain self realization. Anything else is, you know, if it helps us, oh, cool. it's, if it's appropriate, you know, like making a living or taking care of your health. Okay, that's we can file that under karma yoga. Yes. But all this other stuff really is unnecessary. Yeah. Go, for example, going to the gym or uh, styling your hair or well, just I do I do hatha yoga. I go for walks, you know. And of course I'm chanting my mantra as I'm doing it. Yes. That's karma yoga. Yeah, I'm taking care of the body. Because if the body gets sick or if it's uncomfortable or weak, then I can't do my sadhana. I can't do my seva. That's right. It takes a lot of energy to manage all this technology, you know. Uh, but on the other hand, it keeps my mind active. I'm always learning new stuff. And, you know, that's a good thing. So those things that help us in our sadhana, that we should keep that, you know? Because it's not a bad thing to go to the gym. But if we get all caught up in, you know, my body and your body and da 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 da, da then it gets to be a distraction. I exercise by myself. I just do hot yoga. That's it. That's good. It at least helps you sit down and yeah, in, in some kind of posture or hatha yoga in a way. It's also all, it's all good, actually, in a way. As it's I, very yeah. good. Of, of all the different kinds of exercise, I think, hatha yoga and walking is enough. You know, I used to have heart problems in my 40s and 50s. Then I started walking regularly, and I haven't had any problems since. So a little aerobics, a little stretching, that's all you need, and a clean, healthy diet. So, thank you, Aditya. It's been a real pleasure. I'm glad yes. you. I'm glad you got out of your shell. <laughs> yes, uh, you you made it possible. Also, Shakti made it possible. Ma Shakti. Yeah. So, thanks to her. Thanks to you and everyone watching. Also, Namaste. Yeah. Namaste. Om Tat Sat. Om Shakti Om Hari Om Om Shakti Om